Hello Internet, Clef here, welcoming you to a minimalist run let's play of one of my favorite old PC games, King's Quest VI. Now, I imagine a lot of people watching this are not going to be familiar with this game, and probably not this series at all, because this is kind of old. I'm kind of dating myself here. Um, I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'll say that I was enjoying this game not too long after it came out. Uh, it did come out a couple of months after the Super Nintendo was released in the U.S., so late 1992. Um, I'll give a little background on the series in general. This, as you probably guessed, is the sixth entry in a franchise. Um, the first four were... They're, they're, well, now it's a point-and-click adventure game, but it was just an adventure game before. Not point-and-click, because the first games did not have mouse support. Instead, they used text parsers, like the really old-school adventure games. You could move around with the arrow keys, but to do anything, you would have to type in commands, like take key or something like that. Um, the first four were like that. The fifth one changed to a point-and-click interface with the mouse instead of written typed commands and it also added voice acting to the series which was kinda crappy basically it was done in-house by the developers because you know they didn't have a huge budget they were trying this for the first time and it was kind of all over the place the quality was kind of everywhere the production was kind of everywhere but they really tightened it up in King's Quest 6 excuse me <laughs> Uh, King's Quest VI, they hired on some serious talent, um, most notably the main character, Prince Alexander, is voiced by the same actor, voice actor rather, who voiced Beast in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. So that should give you an idea of, I mean, obviously not every character in the game is voiced by like a big name like that, but... They kind of pulled out all the stops when it came to like the main characters, and it sounds way, way better. So, I also want to give a little background on the story, because I'm not going to be watching the opening. This is not meant to be like a full experience thing. As you can see, it's a minimalist run. Um, my goal is going to be to finish the game with as few points as possible. You get points for doing stuff that's good. Not good as in morality, but good as in progressing the game or, you know, picking up an item that's relevant, or will become relevant. <laughs> um, things like that. Uh, a perfect game gets you 231 points, and I recently found out that you can finish it with as few as 116. So I'm going to be showing you just how to do that, and if all goes well, I might do another run of this game with the maximum points, 231. The main thing about the point system in this game is that in order to get the maximum points you have to take the quote unquote hard path through the game. There's a point in the game where it branches out into two paths. It's not really made obvious to the player, it's not really meant to be made obvious to the player where the split happens. I know where it happens because I'm familiar with the game and I will point it out as I get to it. But um, when you split across that path, if, it's, if you take the easy way, quote unquote easy way, there's no way you'll come even close to 231, even if you do everything you can possibly do. And and the hard path, you can if you do everything. It also has more content, and, uh, you know, there's more stuff going on. You learn more, and it also enables the better endings. I'm actually going to be getting the worst ending possible, which is kind of funny. I haven't done that on purpose in a while in this game. So, like I was saying before, I want to give you a quick overview of the story because I'm just going to start standing on a beach and you're just going to be like who is this what's he doing who cares so now the story of King's Quest 5 which I need to tell you very briefly before you understand 6 now the Daventry family at the the it's the royal family of a land called Daventry and we have King Graham Queen Valenice uh, and their two children Princess Rosella and Prince Alexander Alexander is the main character of this game. In King's Quest V, the main character is King Graham. And what happens in King's Quest V is that an evil wizard, Mordak, um, 
basically takes your castle and your family, minus you, because you happen to not be at home at the time, and basically scoops them up magically, shrinks everything down, and puts it in a glass bottle. He does this as revenge for what Alexander did to his brother Mananan in King's Quest III, which was turn him into a cat. And I'm not going to go any deeper into that, but basically just so you'd be like, why does he just attack these people for no reason? But he does that as revenge to try and get Alexander to, t to turn his brother, who's also an evil wizard, Mananan, uh, back into a person from a cat. So in King's Quest V, you rescue your family, and uh, in addition to your family, when you're in Mordak's castle, you also rescue a woman, Kasima, who had been held as a slave girl by Mordak in his castle. She hails from a place called Land of the Green Isles. Now, when you rescue her, you end up have enlisting the help of a good wizard, uh, Crispin Offer, or Crispin, who ends up sending your family back to Daventry along with your castle back in you know, normal size and everything, and back where it's supposed to be. And he also sends Kasima home. Now, the King's Quest series kind of involves some kind of like classic fantasy kind of tropes. So what happens is that when Alexander... Alexander has kind of a love at first sight thing with Kasima. And Kasima kind of reciprocates it too. She invites Alexander to come visit her sometime before they're separated, before they're both sent home by Crispin. Now, King's Quest VI begins with Alexander moping about the castle, thinking about Cosima. He can't get her off his mind. Um, his mother uh, basically points out that this happens a few months after the events of King's Quest V, and Alexander's been asking around. He wants to go visit Cosima in the Land of the Green Isles, but he has no idea how to get there, and everyone he asks doesn't even know... Not only don't they know where it is, but they've never even heard of the Land of the Green Isles. So he's very frustrated and kind of like forlorn over not being able to see this woman who he's kind of fell for, you know? And then what happens is that in their magic mirror, the, the Kingdom of Daventry has three uh, magical items. And that's kind of the thing of King's Quest One, But I won't really go into that. But one of them is a magic mirror. And it, what happens is that it suddenly lights up, and you can see Cosima in a tower. And she's kind of calling out for Alexander, saying, Where are you? I wish you were here. Like, I feel so alone, you know. And you can see the stars outside of the tower. Now, Alexander, being the astute man that he is, he goes running to his mother excited and says, I know how to find Cosima. I saw the stars in the sky outside her window, and I can use them to navigate. So, he takes a crew and heads out, using this new information. Now, the waters around the land of the Green Isles are very treacherous, and he ends up getting in a shipwreck, and he ends up beached on this island, and he's he doesn't even know whether he's whether the island is part of the land of the Green Isles or if it's just somewhere else. Because everything just kind of goes wrong. There's a big shipwreck. He wakes up on this beach alone. His crew is nowhere to be found. His ship is in the distance, wrecked, destroyed. And you just basically start from there. So I think that's good enough background. I've rambled on for almost 10 minutes. But I can make these parts longer than the ones where I'm doing other PC games because... This is not really a high-fidelity graphics game, so I can turn down the bitrate. Also, the resolution is lower. And as you can see, I did some kind of, like, uh, fancy stuff on your right there. I've got my avatar, description of the run, and part one. I have no idea how, part, how many parts there's going to be, because I didn't really plan this ahead. I'm not going to stop at any specific point, just kind of when I feel like I've done enough. Anyway, let's get into the game. So here we are. We're on the beach. And uh, you have no idea what's going on. There's your ship in the background. Now I'm going to turn the speed up here. And here's your score. You'll hear kind of a little jingle. You'll become very familiar with it as you see me do this run. Um, whenever you get points. And you can come back here and check how close you are to a perfect score. Uh, I'm not going to come anywhere near this. As you can see on your right, 116 is what I'm going to have at the very end of the game. So... One thing about this game that's very important, 
things that flash or sparkle. Here's one thing. See that? That is the game's way of telling you that's an important thing. Because of the low resolution of this game, it's kind of pixel hunting, but King's Quest VI isn't too bad about it. They'll give you like little cues like this. But sometimes things aren't obvious, and you have to kind of experiment a little. Fortunately, I know exactly what to do, so I'm just going to kind of explain what I'm doing. So here I am. I've got nothing on me. Alexander is carrying nothing. As you can see, the game is fully narrated, so I'm not going to be talking as much as usual, just in between stuff, because I'm not going to be interrupting the, uh, the narration. Now, as you can see, I have four icons to interact with my environment. I have walk, touch, look, and speak. Uh, this is the least useful, if you know what you're doing. <laughs> I'm almost never going to be using that. Um, it's mostly the other three. Now, if I remember something funny, like for example this, well, you can decide how funny it is, but this will kind of set the tone for the game. The plank seems bored and does not reply. Okay, very silly little pun, right? Now, the game it the game does take itself seriously, but it, like it's not like a parody game or anything. But it does have a sense of humor and the sense of humor is like that. <laughs> it's not very edgy, you know, it's very kind of classic, very just silly, simple stuff. Okay, it's been 11 and a half minutes and I haven't actually started the game yet. Very sorry, but I wanted to give enough of a background that even people who have never touched this series can get full enjoyment out of this run. So the first thing I'm going to do is pick up my ring. Alexander picks up his royal insignia ring from the beach. Now it washed ashore. Let me just, uh, I'm going to move my window here for a second. Alright, just because it's getting a little distracting. Okay. So there's my ring. It washed up on the shore. It's basically the only real kind of belonging that's here. Um, another thing about this game is that there was a, a floppy disk version and a CD version. The floppy disk version came out um, in late 1992, and then a year later there's a CD version, which is the one I'm playing now. CD version has better portraits, more detailed... It looks very different than the disc version. I can't really compare them, but... Alexander pushes the plank to one side. A box has been partially buried under sand. That's the little jingle I told you about. And there was one where I picked up the ring, too. See, that's one that's not immediately obvious. And then there's a little box here. I'm looking in the box. Oh, look, another sparkly thing. This is a coin. Alexander takes the coin and leaves the ruined box where it is. <laughs> That's the sound of closing it. All the sound effects, and in fact the music, were done in general MIDI. So you're going to have stuff that sounds a little odd, but... So this, this is a Daventry coin. So the rest of the box is just sand. So I'm going to head up to the crossroads here and go to the village. Oh, sorry, knock the mic there. And head into Ali's books. Hello. I will be right up. There you go. So that gives you an idea of how the portraits look. They look a lot more realistic, or at least a lot more detailed. Sometimes they look less realistic than the disc version. Now, what can I do for you? So I'm going to find out where I am and what's going on by talking to Ali. Good day, merchant. Can you tell me what land this is? Why, certainly. This is the Isle of the Crown, the main isle of the land of the Green Isles. Thank the fates. I knew I was close when we sank, but I dared not hope. Tell me, how fares your Princess Cosima? The Princess? She is well enough, I suppose. Is she near? The castle of the crown on the hill, sir. And good luck. So I'm going to talk to him one more time. What can you tell me about the land of the Green Isles? That is a big question, young man. Perhaps you will be so kind as to first tell me who you are and what exactly you want to know. My name is Alexander. 
You said that this is the Isle of the Crown, but I'd like to know whatever else you can tell me about this island, and if there are other islands nearby. This island is called the Isle of the Crown, because the royal family's castle is here. Besides the castle, we also have this village, and the docks over to the west. There are at least three other islands. The Isle of the Sacred Mountain, the Isle of the Beast, and the Isle of Wonder. At least three? Does no one know for certain? <laughs> this is no ordinary land, Alexander. The land of the Green Isles has always been a place of vague boundaries, as if islands come and go. Legend speaks of a fourth island, an isle shrouded in mists. I myself have never seen it. Then, too, the land of the Green Isles is said to exist on the boundaries of this world and the next. Even darker places are reputed to be closer here than anywhere else in the world. That's quite a claim. <laughs> claim, yes, but probably just local superstition. We who live here on the Isle of the Crown, at least, sleep well enough at night. Those first three islands you mentioned, how might I learn more about them? Ideally, a young man seeking such knowledge would travel to their shores and learn about them firsthand. Meeting the leaders of each place would be helpful, naturally. Unfortunately, the ferry no longer runs between the islands. There has been much political unrest, and it has been too dangerous to travel for years. Perhaps the ferryman can tell you more. He has little enough to do these days. And if you haven't been there already, you might seek an audience at the castle. Thank you kindly, merchant for all your good advice. Ah, but advice is free, Alexander. Making use of it costs much more. All right, so that was a fair bit of exposition. So you learn a lot about the land of the Green Isles, and he directs you to go talk to the ferryman. Now, as I said, this is a minimalist run, so there's probably gonna be a lot of objects and stuff around here like, hey, I wonder what that is. Uh, I'm gonna be passing over most of that, <laughs> and probably not even mention it. So let's go, because, uh, she doesn't matter. Hey, stranger, come join me. The water is wonderful, and I can show you the way to the next island. This is a trap, so let's ignore him. That's strange. The young boy in the water just disappeared. Oh well, perhaps he just dove under the water. One of the things that's recurring in this game is that there's a genie who is continually trying to trick you into killing yourself. Now remember what I said before about the waters around the land of the Green Isles being very treacherous. In fact, you can die on any of the shores in this game by walking out more than a few feet into the water. You just get dragged out the shore and you drown and die. Um, you can die fairly easily in this game. I didn't really mention that about Sierra games, although I mentioned it kind of offhand in the Walking Dead uh, Let's Play. Um, King's Quest VI is not as unforgiving as uh, five or some of the ones before, but it is difficult. I, rather, it's very easy to kill yourself if you're not careful. So it's judicious to save your game a lot. I won't really be because I know what to do. So I'm going to talk to the ferryman. I knock on his door. Yeah, what do you want? He has no idea that uh, I, kind of, I kind of buddied up with Ali here, so let's let him know. Excuse me, my name is Alexander. The owner of the bookshop in the village told me you might be able to help me. I hear you used to run this ferry for the islands. I'd like to talk to you if you have a moment. You say old Ali sent you? I can't see why. The ferry's not running, you know. I understand. I'd just like to talk to you about the islands, if you don't mind. Well, I guess it'd be all right, if Ali sent you. Well, don't just stand there. Come on inside. It seems very trust-based. <laughs> what is it you wanted to talk about, young man? 
So there's going to be a little more exposition, lots of chatting, but I feel like if I skip over that, then it's really just going to feel like a speed run. And this is not what I, I don't intend to be doing a speed run here, so. I'm a visitor to these islands. I'd like to learn what I can about the area. So you said outside. What is it you want to know? Well, for one thing, why has the island's only ferry been dry docked? Huh. It just ain't safe to sail these days. What with the islands feuding and all. Wazir al Hazred ordered the ferry closed till things settled down. Me? I don't think she'll ever see water again. <sighs> but why are the islands feuding? You got me. Something about stolen property or some such thing. Tis a real shame. Things used to be so friendly. Then this unrest is recent. A few years is all, but it's been long enough. Perhaps if the ferry were repaired... This old thing? This ferry's been out of water so long she's no longer even seaworthy. Her boards have dry rot. She'd fall apart at the first taste of seawater. But there must be some way to get off this island. There's only one other way to travel that I know of. A magic map. The owner of the pawn shop can tell you more about that than I can, Alexander. The owner of the pawn shop. Now, I'm gonna need this, so let's try to get it. I see you have a rabbit's foot. Has it brought you much luck? As you can see, my luck's been out for some time now, despite that old charm. Why don't you take it with you? Perhaps giving the darn thing away will bring me good fortune at last. Perhaps it will at that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm pretty much done. Well, I think I'll be going now. Thanks for allowing me into your home. Posh, not at all. It breaks the boredom, if you know what I mean. <sighs> it seems like he's very sad. <laughs> so, to the pawn shop we go to ask about this magic map. So, just doing the bare essentials. <laughs> Good day. Now, one thing I want to mention about this guy here, the pawn shop owner is coincidentally voiced by the same person who voices uh, Lee Everett in the Walking Dead game that I was just let's playing. So I just only learned that about a week ago, and it really blew my mind. Let's take a mint. Alexander takes a mint. Uh, let's talk to this guy about the map. Excuse me, merchant, but the ferryman mentioned that you might have a magic map of the land of the Green Isles. Why, as a matter of fact, I do. I keep it under the counter. It's been gathering dust so long that I nearly forgot about it. It was quite a few years ago, you see. The estate of a wealthy wizard fell into my hands when he died. It was useless magical junk mostly, which reminds me. I've still got some things of his in the back that I need to dump out. Anyway, the magic map was the one true treasure in the lot. The wizard was quite old and feeble and had enchanted the map to aid in traveling. It is said that one need only desire to be on an island depicted on the map to find oneself there. It is a very valuable map, as you can imagine. Unfortunately, no one is interested in traveling these days. It is far too dangerous with the current state of the kingdom. What would you take for the map? I would normally want something magic in return, but since I am hardly overrun with prospective buyers, I would be willing to take anything of equal value in exchange. So, I need to give him something valuable for the magic map. This is really the only valuable thing I have. So it's going to have to be my royal insignia ring. Would you be willing to take my family ring in exchange for the magic map? Daventry, are you a king then? No, that's my father, King Graham. I'm just Alexander. Well, Prince Alex, she is a beautiful ring. Are you sure you can part with such a unique family heirloom? The ring does mean a lot to me. I didn't always have a family, you know. Still, it is only gold. There are more important things at stake now. Then you now own a magic map, Prince Alex. I will keep your ring out of sight for a few days. If you find anything else of great value in your travels, you can come back for your ring. I would hate to see it melted down for gold. 
Ah, and a warning about the map. It will only operate when you are out in the open and within sight of the sea. The limitation has something to do with the teleport spell ingredients. You might try the beach. Thank you. You are very kind. And I'll remember about the map. All right, while, while the cloaked man is walking up, I'm going to point out a little bit. Um, when he said, I didn't always have a family, you know. That's another reference to King's Quest 3. Uh, in King's Quest 3, you're also playing as Alexander, except he's Gwydion, I believe his name is. And he, like I said, in 3, he turned Mananan into a cat. Now, what happened with that is that Mananan was a wizard who would capture young boys, baby boys, actually, and raise them as slaves and kill them at the age of 18 so that they wouldn't get old enough to kind of uh, overthrow him, you know, kind of rebel. So Alexander was one of the children stolen by him. And so he grew up as a slave for Mananan, and he managed to get his hands, you know, kind of the short version. He managed, because he's very bright, you know, He's a very uh, intelligent and very resourceful person. He manages to get access to a, his spell book and some spells, and he turns Mananan into a cat and eventually makes his way back to Daventry, where he's reunited with his family, and he finds out that he's indeed Prince Alexander of Daventry, not just some random kid, because he, he didn't meet his family until he was 18. Or maybe 17, because I think the game takes place shortly before your 18th birthday. Just a bit of a story. <laughs> filling, filling in some blanks. Suddenly, the old man in the concealing cloak sneaks past Alexander, and with a sneaky dart of his hand, steals a mint from the candy jar. The old man stuffs the mint into his mouth, and wobbles unsteadily out of the pawn shop. He seems affected by the mint. Master! I was a smurfling in the village as you wished, and I saw a manger. I don't know, a danger? No, 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 a stranger there, he, he says, oh, he's Prince Blavintander of Slavitry. You fool, you've been eating those mints again. I ordered you to stop that. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, no, no. Now, who did this stranger say he was? Prince Salamander of Pageantry. <laughs> I think. You idiot. Are you trying to tell me that Prince Alexander of Daventry is here? Confound it! That's the young man Cosima met at Mordak's castle. The timing could not be worse. Tell me, what is he doing? He was in the pawn shop buying a magic <gasps> smap. Magic smap? What is this magic smap? With the smap, he can travel to other islands. Master. That's a map, you don't! Oh, drat it all. I thought I took care of the only means of travel. By my scimitar. I can't have him stirring things up. Not now! Get a hold of yourself and listen carefully, Shamir. Go to the other islands and tell them... Okay, so... My little bits of input on that. Uh, first thing, the cloaked man is the genie who I already mentioned was that kid on the docks. He was in disguise as the kid on the docks. Secondly, one thing to notice about the genie is that his eyes sparkle gold. Um, that is the primary means of identifying the genie in the game when he's trying to trick you. Uh, number three, 
Prince Salamander of Pageantry always makes me chuckle. You probably heard, even though I try to keep quiet during the cutscenes, it always makes me laugh a little bit. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, that is the Wazir talking to the genie. And he's basically reporting to him that I have a way of traveling. And he knows who I am, as I already explained what happened, so that you're just like, who's Kasima? who's Mordak, what's he talking about? And that's why I mentioned that stuff, so that you'll, when they reference it, you'll be like, oh, alright. So, whoops, I'm not done in there. My mistake. Good day, Prince Alexander. Thank you. Again, Lee Everett's voice actor. So, I'm going to give him my one crappy little coin. I have this copper coin. Is it of any value to you at all? Hmm, most interesting. I have never seen a Daventry coin before, but it is copper genuine enough. I might even find a buyer who is interested in foreign currency. The items on the front counter are the only things in the store that I can let go for the price of one copper. You may make your choice from there. Alexander looks at the items on the counter to make his selection. Now you're not locked into this choice. That mechanical nightingale looks intriguing. I believe I'll take it. Very well. Your coin is well spent. Remember, this is a pawn shop. I am always willing to take back my own goods in trade. I'll remember. Thank you. So, there are four items there, and you can swap them freely anytime you want, one for one, like he said. And, uh, I'll be using three of them in this run. The first one I need is the Mechanical Nightingale. So I'm going to kind of trigger an event. Now remember the pawn shop owner, when he was talking about the map, he said he that you reminded him he had some magical stuff to throw away. So I'm going to leave and go back, and that's going to trigger him coming out to throw things away. Alright, so let's look through his garbage. <laughs> Alexander sorts through the odds and ends that the pawn shop owner dumped into the pot. Magic exploding gum wrappers. A shattered crystal ball, a cracked wand, a fake thumb. Hmm. Near the bottom, Alexander finds a little glass bottle labeled ink. It appears to be empty, but Alexander decides to take it anyway. You never know when a small bottle will come in handy. Now, it looks like it's invisible, but it's not invisible. It's full of invisible ink. I mean, it looks like it's invisible. It looks like it's empty, rather. <laughs> it's invisible ink. Yeah, that exists. So, the next thing to do is to head down to the beach and get going. There's the castle. I will not be going there until the end. <laughs> so let's start traveling. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Here are the islands. This is where I am now. Then there's the Isle of Wonder, the Isle of the Sacred Mountain, and the Isle of the Beast. First, I'm going to be going to go to the Alexander Isle of the Sacred Mountain. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander picks the flower and is startled by its hideously strong, skunk-like odor. For a moment, he can smell nothing else. Okay, so stinky flower. Now... Alexander pulls out his magic map. The next thing in the game is the first big test in the game. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander hears someone coming. Prepare yourself. Five fierce guards of the aisle we be. Watch for a foreign man, said he. With ears and nose, tongue, hands and eyes. Its nature cannot be disguised. If man it be, then man it dies. So... 
Their little rhyme, I know it's a little hard to understand because their cadence is so weird. I'm going to turn down this volume for just a moment. Um, they say, watch for a foreign man, said he. So, remember in the cutscene, he said, now, Shamir, go to the other islands and tell them. What he did was he basically had the genie go to all of the islands and tell uh, people there <laughs> that there is a foreign person, traveler, who is dangerous and that they should kill him. So, every island you go to is going to have people who assume that they should kill you because the genie said so. And no, they know that the genie uh, works with the wazir and they don't, they don't know that the wazir is evil. I mean, it's kind of obvious to us, like he has the evil voice and everything, but yeah. So the way this works is that the gnomes, there are five of them, and they all have one sense. Uh, there's, you know, like eyes, like they said, uh, uh, there's vision, you know, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. And I have to basically trick all five of them, one by one, into not believing that I'm a man, but rather something else. Old control, smell your smell. Do that which you do so well. Okay, so I have to fool the nose gnome. So I'm going to do that with the stinky flower, the flower of stench. Alexander holds the flower of stench out to the gnome with the jumbo nose. Tom Troll I am, that's all I'll be. My nose knows all on land and sea. A flower of stench has washed ashore. A flower tis all and nothing more. As you imagine, I'm not I'm gonna be fooling each of them with something different, so they're gonna start arguing because their senses are going to be contradicting each other. Listen, hark you, Brokenor, do your duty as you soar. With your ears, please tell us more. So I'm going to play the mechanical nightingale for him. And this is one of the things that kind of doesn't make sense. Alexander winds the tin nightingale and plays it for the gnome with the monumental ears. You'd imagine that he could hear him cranking, winding up the nightingale. But that's like, ignored. <laughs> I like the tune it makes. That's cute. A nose is not a way to spy. My ears cannot be told a lie. A nightingale is all there be. No man is near, and so say me. Taste, grump, grump, that we might know whether the friend or whether foe. So I'm going to be fooling this guy with the mint. Now the weird thing about this, there's a couple of weird things that don't really make a whole lot of sense. First of all, if it was a mint, uh, how would they have gotten alerted by it? A mint is not going to make enough noise to have them come check what's going on. And also, I'm basically putting it onto his tongue. Whereas if a mint was there by itself, it wouldn't be able to just hop up into his mouth, but oh well. Alexander holds the mint out for the gnome with the gigantic mouth. Grump Flump knows a tasty treat. It matters not what others bleat. No danger is this one so sweet. That guy sounds a whole lot... Oh yeah, I screwed up there. Uh, sorry. That voice sounds a lot like Droopy Dog, <laughs> you might have noticed. Trilly Dilly, use your hands. Is it beast or is it man? So I got the touch gnome. I'm going to be using the rabbit's foot to fool him. Alexander holds the rabbit foot out for the gnome with the huge hands. <laughs> Oh, you mad? What aileth thee? A bunny can't trill merrily. A hare does not at all taste sweet. A rabbit here is all we greet. 
See, he's kind of like, what's wrong with you guys? This is the one that's kind of the hardest to figure out on your own, but you, you dump the invisible ink on yourself. Alexander pours the contents of the empty looking ink bottle over himself. By all that's beauteous, fair, and sightly, four morons do I sleep with nightly. There's nothing there at all, I say. Enough of this. Let's now away. Alexander did it. He's fooled the guards. All right. So I think that's going to be where I uh, finish. Wait. <laughs> I don't know if I did that right. Ooh. I'd like to give it a name. All right, good. Let's call that part one end. All right. So, yeah, I think that's a good place to finish. It's kind of a milestone. I hope you've enjoyed watching it despite me chattering on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> trying to give you as much background and information as I think you might need to get full enjoyment out of this. And I hope that you will be uh, looking out for part two. In the meantime, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. I always appreciate your feedback, especially when I'm doing something new like this. Well, I mean, it's old, but it's new. You know what I mean. <laughs> Thanks for watching.